Dr. Freeth's in recent weeks been at the sharp end of, of, a, of a discussion about ultra fast broadband, and we've seen um, an unprecedented campaign where um, Telstra has joined with a lot of, large number of other telecommunications providers and two ends and federated farmers, notably, um, to oppose the manner in which the government is intending to legislate for the ultra fast broadband initiative. Um, and I'm here talking to Dr. Freeth today about that and about how various issues around the ultra-fast broadband impact on um, consumers. Um, Scoop itself um, has been a customer of Telstra for, um, for, for a decade. And um, I don't know if you realise this, but for the first um, five or six years, we were hosted by Telstra. I did recall that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, we, were, we were very, very grateful for the support that we received mm -hmm. in those early years. Um, so much of the, when we talk about ultra-fast broadband and when you read about it in the paper, there's often a lot of discussion about things like contention rates and, and um, I think the latest thing is a special access, access undertaking, all of which is a little bit confusing. So I thought it might be useful for us to sort of go back to what this is really all about, which is delivering services to people's homes via wires. And um, in the context of that, so I mean, we've now got things like IPTV, which um, Telstra has recently launched T-Box, which is an IPV service. Um, HD video cameras now sort of cost $200 mm. a, a pop. Yep. We've got um, 16, 20 megapixel still cameras, which mm. are sort of uni almost universal, and we have internet-enabled enabled televisions as sort of standard these days. Meanwhile, online we have services like Flickr and Vacasa and um, video telephony and multiplayer player gaming and online backup. And, and um, Google Documents, all of which are sort of revolutionising the way in which we use our computers to communicate with each other. Um, when we start to think about fast internet future, we often, we have got all this range of products and services that don't even exist yet, and especially for the next 10 years. So in the ultra-fast broadband um, discussions that we're in the, in the, in the, in, we're, we're in the, in the moment, we're talking about technologies which, which don't exist. Facebook didn't exist when, um, 10 years ago, um, I mean, high high definition cameras didn't exist ten years ago. Um, so Telstra Telstra has a two billion dollar investment in this network here in New Zealand. I was wondering if you could start perhaps by telling us a little bit about that network, um, how it's been developed, and what what it's capable of doing. Certainly, uh, I think the network we have today is a sort of reflection of the companies we we came from, and that traces back to Clear Communications, Saturn TV. Um, and Telstra in its early days. Uh, and the Saturn TV origins clearly represent the cable network, which today is uh, hybrid fibre coax in Christchurch and Wellington, probably the jewel in the crown in many ways, and the network we've upgraded to uh, docks at 3 or 100 megabits per second, which we can come back to later. Um, and that provides a triple play, the TV, the broadband and the phone. Uh, the sort of core of the network which comes out of Clear Communications and Telstra is what we call our core backbone, which runs up and down the country. And we have about three to four um, legs to that in both islands, depending on the island. There's four in the North Island and three in the, the South. Uh, and that's a big pipe, uh, and it's um, an IP pipe, and it was, one of the, it was the first in the country. Uh, and it provides all the backbone, provides all the traffic, uh, and it provides the very specialised services that we um, generate for Department of Defence and Land Revenue uh, and some of the big enterprise customers, as well as our wholesale customers because we wholesale the services to a lot of other people in New Zealand. And branching out from that network is fibre in most central business districts of all provincial towns and cities in the country. Um, clearly that's a bit more restricted in some areas like Auckland and elsewhere. Um, and that forms a sort of core backbone. About two years ago, we invested around $25 million and we doubled the size of our consumer network by unbundling 62 of telecom exchanges. So we put equipment into their exchanges and made the copper from the exchange to the home ours, um, made that network ours. Uh, and we've, we now sell on that service phone and broadband services too. Um, around uh, around about 15 to 20,000 other customers, and that market share is growing mm. across the country. 
uh, and then we service the rest of our consumer customers and some of our business customers uh, by a thing we call telecom tails, which is effectively where we buy the service or the product, but it still runs across telecom's network. Uh, and I think we think about it like a patchwork quilt. We have network that suits the customers where they are. Um, we've never built a mobile network for many different reasons, but today we run what's called a mobile virtual network operator system with Vodafone, uh, whereby we effectively are the network operator to our customers. Um, and of course we still have um, well over 10,000 other customers on Telecom's old CDMA network um, that we're migrating across to uh, the new service. Um, so it's quite extensive, but I think the thing that's always characterised Telstra uh, is we were the first into IP, um, internet protocol services. We were really driving the leading um, innovations around fibre and its use, particularly in the large enterprise space uh, in the very early days. And I think, again, that's the thing about clear communications. Uh, I have their first competitive toll bill ever issued on my wall. Uh, you know, it's been 20 years of hard work by Clear and a number of predecessors to get us where we are today. Right. Um, within Christchurch and Wellington, I mean, that, the network there um, was originated at first in Capitol from, from um, Saturn. Saturn. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Um, and, but the, but the, that was then widened and, and when the networks went into Wellington and Christchurch, which are, which are very extensive, I think they go to most, most parts of the city. That's correct. There's, there was only one area in Christchurch where we didn't build the network, uh, and we call it the Northwest Cor Corridor. It's just a small, happens to be one of the more affluent areas of Christchurch. Mm -hmm. But uh, where the build got stopped, um, because Telstra had just taken over the company and wasn't sure about continuing. Uh, but certainly in Wellington and Christchurch today, we have about 52% market share of homes passed. So wherever we get a chance to compete, and we did over those years, mm. we, we, we built up to that. But that took 15 years to build that market share. Uh, and that's an important point around UFB as well. Mm. Um, but it was, you know, in those days, um, it was some, one of the most advanced network systems you could offer to get triple play into the home uh, and to get very high speed broadband into the home and it stood the test of time really. Now, and you have similar sorts of technology in, in, um, in Australia too, don't you? Cable and coax cable, is that? Y yes, again Telstra reflects that type of history where you know, we all start, well we didn't start with copper of course, mm. uh, but uh, Telstra started with copper um, then the next most advanced network you could build was hybrid fibre coax, we call it HFC, mm. uh, and we call it here the same. Uh, and then that led on to things like uh, unbundled exchanges and then to fibre. So it's been a natural progression. Uh, but, but an HFC network has both copper and fibre in it. That's why it's called a coax hybrid. network. Right. It's a hybrid that has both those mechanisms running. Yeah. So we've been able to upgrade the one in Wellington and Christchurch equal to fibre speeds for broadband, uh, if indeed our customers ever desire it. Okay, so I mean, I was, I, um, I was recently trial, I trialled the, the, the 100 megabit per second. Yeah, you've still got it, I hope, at the moment. I've still got mine. Have they turned your I top? think they might have turned mine off. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> um, I mean, it was going blis blisteringly yeah, fast yeah. over Christmas. Um, and I, I found that I could get 68 oh, yeah. megabits per second to Sydney. Yeah. I think versus about 25 to downtown Wellington, which um, which I thought was quite 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 extraordinary. Um, now to put this in a bit in perspective for the for the um, for the viewers, um, in theory, that 68 megabits per second is eight megabytes per second. Um, so a full DVD could be downloaded in 10 minutes, for example, or you could upload if you could get that sort of upload speed a four gigabyte file of photographs in, a, in some, some sort of 20, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so I, and, I mean I've also sort of trialled it for, for some actual real life um, downloads on the international basis and, and discovered that I could get my gaming client, which is sort of another five gigabyte file, um, in two and a half hours versus previously it used to take about 24. Mm -hmm. um, however, that sort of begs the question about what the difference is between very, very fast internet speeds, which A, this network is capable of delivering, and the sort of speeds that you actually get. Um, and then that begs the question is, if, 
is five out of the door the answer to New Zealand's problems in this context. So perhaps um, just to, to, to hit that question in two parts, could you talk a little bit about New Zealand's connection to the rest of the world, and, and particularly Telstra's capacity in that regard? Sure. Um, just, yes, yeah, so I think it's important just before we go there to recognise that ultra-fast broadband is a service and can be very different to the network that provides it, and we'll, we'll come back to that, yeah. and it all depends on definitions, of course, mm -hmm. around that. Um, our connection to the world is through, clearly, the Tasman uh, fibre cables that go to Australia, uh, and then back up to the Pacific, and then head into a myriad of networks of, of fibres around the world. Um, and certainly, uh, we've got the Southern Cross cable um, that's been running across it, and more recently we've seen proposals from Cordia um, and from, I think, Pacific Fibre Now, uh, and SPIN, the new Caledonian French consortium. Uh, and a lot of that's been issues around so-called capacity constraints. Um, as I understand it, there's very few capacity constraints. The main constraints is one of price, and certainly the lack of competition across the Tasman, and then maybe up into the Pacific and the US, I, I don't have huge knowledge of that, uh, has meant that the price for per whatever it is, gigabit, megabit, whatever, has been always very high uh, and always quite an issue. Retail, it seems to be about $1,000 a megabit. Yeah, I, I would be absolutely sure, but that could easily yeah. be, be true. Um, I always get a little, I see a number of figures, as you can imagine, yeah. and I'm, I'm not necessarily that good at always recalling them. What we've always seen, of course, is when there's a threat to someone else building, the price immediately drops down a bit as the owners of those networks um, uh, reduce their price a little. Uh, clearly, we, if, if people wish to invest capital in building those types of cable networks, it's got to be a good thing. Mm. Um, I, I'm not sure about the economics, and that's over to them. I, I would imagine the incumbents have a huge amount of margin still to go and still make money. Um, and we've looked at business cases ourselves and they've always been extremely difficult to, to do. But I wish them well and it's certainly going to open up. And one of the things I think that's important, you were speaking about your experiences, is the feedback we've had from those trials that we undertook. It's not so much the speed but the data caps. Uh, and that is linked to the international fibre capacity as well and the prices you pay. Um, we've had quite a lot of feedback that we really don't care that much about the speed, but we're certainly a bit worried about the amount of usage that we're paying and the over-usage that we're paying for. Mm. Uh, and I think that's going to be the issue for everybody. I don't have an answer for it at the moment. Um, I've asked our consumer business to look at it pretty carefully and can we come up with some innovative plans to address that. Um, as a personal user, um, why I appreciate the uh, email uh, information from Telstra Clear telling me when I'm getting up there it doesn't stop my daughters and children over <laughs> over using again and um, you know no doubt you know and I'm on, on a pretty big limit but I think again it reflects a sort of um, convergences and issues we're having in the usage um, you know I think a lot is made of the so-called connection to the world a lot is made of um, things like pairing a lot is made of you know we don't have enough um, at the end of the day, probably the argument is we probably don't have enough at the price that suits me uh, as, as a customer. As a customer is the issue, and I'm not being critical about that. I mm. think uh, I think people um, have high expectations as we've come in, into a global world, uh, and I think there is a sort of um, perhaps not a good understanding of the type of costs involved in putting these fibres down and maintaining them um, as well.